some of you may have heard this story. It takes place, oh, just a few years ago. I am cooking popcorn on our stove. I'm cooking popcorn the old-fashioned way. And I'm telling you what, I don't mean to boast or brag, but I do know how to do it. It is some good popcorn. You cannot find it in any store better than what we can pop on that stove. Now, having said that, I don't do it on the stove anymore. I actually do it in the microwave, but not microwaved popcorn. It's the real stuff, but microwave. We've got this new container. Well, let me tell you the story of why we have the new container. So I'm cooking popcorn on the stove. I've got one of those nice big pots. I put my oil in. I put the kernels. And I'm also watching Monday Night Football. The Washington then Redskins, now Commanders, are playing the Cowboys. Arch rivals. I am a die-hard Washington Redskins Commanders fan. And I despise the Cowboys. I cannot stand them. So it's Monday Night Football, and they're playing. And so I've put my popcorn, the oil is on. I'm waiting for the first kernel to pop. Because once I know the first kernel pops, I can put the rest of them in, and we're good to go. Well, I go in to wait for that kernel to pop. And I'm sitting here, and I'm I'm watching the very beginning of the game. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting on our sofa in the den such that I could see the picture on the wall in like the little breakfast nook of our kitchen. And I look, and I see this orange glow in that picture. And I'm thinking, I've never seen a fire in that picture. I had flames coming out of that pot that tall. My fi- my grease, my oil had caught on fire. So needless to say, that was a fire that needed to be put out immediately. And oh my goodness, as maybe some of you know, when you, when you, you've got a mess. Smoke all throughout the house. Sherry, I think you were laughing with too much enjoyment at my story. I need to talk to you after the service. So... Now, we've got this special silicon thing, and I'm telling you what, it, it, it cooks good popcorn too. But that, that fire needed to be put out. Fire is not all bad. Uh, fires can cook our food. Fires can heat our homes. Sometimes fire is used in crucial uh, crafting, like blacksmithing, pottery, glass blowing, metalworking. Sometimes Fire is used in industrial processes like combustion engines. And sometimes electricity can be produced by combustion in power plants. Well, in our text that we're going to look at this morning, it's essentially, while the word fire is not there, it it basically talks about fires, some of which need to burn brightly. The fire, the Spirit of God wants to set a blaze in our lives, in our church. Man, let that fire go. But there are some other fires that need to be extinguished immediately because they are deadly, dangerous fires. Not so much to the skin or to your homes or to your car, but to your soul, to your mind, to a church. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 to 22 serve as our text this morning. Paul says in very clear terms, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. And then it's almost as if he's saying, now having tested everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So let me again kind of set the context of this overall letter. Many of you will remember that Paul got run out of Thessalonica after having been there for a month maximum. The truth he was proclaiming was turning that little part of the world upside down, and so people didn't like it, and he got run out of town. It wasn't that he was scared. It wasn't that he was a scaredy cat. He, at that point in time, wisdom said, it's time for you to go. Well, after he left, Paul is unbelievably concerned about the well-being of these people. And Paul knows it's possible that God could have raised up another man or another man or two 
with the ability to hear from God and proclaim truth. In that era, that still could have happened because after all, he did not leave behind a seminary trained pastor. He did not leave behind a, a case of Bibles. As a matter of fact, they didn't have, not one person in that whole little church had a copy of the scriptures. They probably didn't have a whole copy of a letter. They don't even have this one yet. <laughs> And so when Paul leaves there, he's concerned about those things. In his absence, um, God may have raised up somebody else to proclaim truth. Um, in, in, in that age, the gift of prophecy could be held by various people, as Acts 13, verses 1 and 2 tell us. Acts 13, verse 1. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Simeon were two of those. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. But now Paul also knows at the same time that God could have, now he doesn't know this, at the same time Paul could have, I mean, God could have raised up somebody else in that Thessalonian church, he also knew that some false prophets could have been mingling with them. He also knows that heresy could be rising up. And so those prophecies that are being proclaimed by anybody needed to be tested. And keep in mind, when Paul writes this letter to the Thessalonians, they didn't have neat and tidy worship services like, like we're accustomed to. You didn't have a full-blown pastoral staff who's planned this order of service, and you've got a pastor who's prepared a message, et cetera, et cetera. No, they probably met in somebody's home. They sat around and maybe they discussed truth that they had heard Paul preached. Or maybe there was someone who was traveling and, and that person said, well, now I'm going to tell you that that's wonderful. But I also, I heard Peter preach and he proclaimed this truth. And so they would sit around and, and discuss that truth. And so it might be kind of a setting that's alluded to in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 to 29. When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation. Let all things be done for building up. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. That's probably very similar to the atmosphere of the worship that's taking place among the Thessalonians. So if somebody, anybody says anything that they say is from the Lord, well, you test it. You test it. Is it good fire or bad fire? In other words, so with all of that in mind, this collection of five exhortations in chapter 5, verses 19 to 22, it represents an attempt on Paul's part to help the church not err in one of two ways. Number one, he's, also, he's basically saying, look, don't be cynical. Don't be cynical and automatically dismiss everything you might hear from somebody whose name is not Paul. Don't be cynical. Number two, don't be gullible either. Somebody might come into your midst and have all of these credentials and claim to have had all of these experiences. Don't be automatically cynical and don't be gullible. So with that in mind, I've got two overarching exhortations for you from this text, and then there are several developmental points that we will bring out as well. So number one, don't resist the Spirit's ministry. In verses 19 and 20, we are being encouraged, don't, don't dismiss what the Spirit of God might be doing. So, first, be receptive to Spirit-initiated promptings. Be receptive to Spirit-initiated promptings. I draw that from verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the spirit. The word sp a quench here is an appropriate word given the use of fire as a metaphor of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is trying to light a fire in your life, if the Holy Spirit is trying to light a fire in your church, don't quench that. Uh, imagine a candle. And as, as maybe you've done or you've seen done, I mean, if you do it quick enough, you don't even have to have any moisture on your fingers. You can take the, the light, the, the fire from a candle, and you can quench it. 
Well, that's the imagery that he's saying here. Don't quench what the true Holy Spirit of God might be doing in your life. Now, we're going to look specifically at how he talks about quenching the Spirit with regard to prophetic utterings, but uh, can we just pause for a moment and think through some other ways that you and I can quench the Spirit? We quench the Spirit anytime we resist His promptings to do something. And throughout your Christian experience, the Lord, the Spirit of God, prompts us to do any number of things. He may have prompted you today to invite someone to Easter. He may have prompted you today to invite someone, um, uh, well, not only to be a part of our Easter services, but maybe to come to the... What? The Spirit prompts us to do any number of things. He prompts us to get involved in a ministry. Some of you might have been prompted when Kevin mentioned the, the cookout and how you could get involved, packing eggs or whatever the case. If the Spirit prompts you to do something, you, you know He is, and you don't. Well, that, that's, that's quenching the Spirit. Um, God may prompt you to call somebody, to check up on somebody, to visit somebody. And if you don't do that, you're, you're, you're quenching the Spirit. God may prompt you to give sacrificially on this occasion, or God may prompt you to give to this person in need, and it's, it's off the books, it's off the record, but God has prompted you to do that. To not do that is to quench his spirit. Another way, we quench the spirit when we do not believe that God can do abundantly more than we ask or think. Most all of us know that Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, to him be the glory. So if you and I put God in our little box, if you and I treat God like he's a manageable God instead of the creator of the universe, man, we can, we can quench God's spirit. When we pray, we, we, we pray little, little prayers that even a lesser God could answer. I think we're, we're quenching the Spirit. Um, remember when, when Jesus is interacting with his disciples, there's a multitude. There's at least 5,000 gathered. They're hungry, and Jesus asks, you know, so how, how are we going to provide bread? And the disciples started going, we figure it's going to take at least 200 denarii. They didn't have any money, but they calculated what it would cost. Why they did that, I don't know, because they didn't have any money. Well, you know what they ended up doing? They ended up putting God in a box, and they quenched the spirit, if you will, because they've got the very Son of God in their midst. Now, granted, it's early on, and, and I'd have probably been right there with them. I'd have probably handed the calculator. Uh, but, boy, Jesus would turn, on, would, would turn around and, and multiply the loaves and the fishes. We quench the spirit by tolerating any unrepentant sin, whether personally or in the church. Lewis Sperry Schaefer, he wrote, the spirit is quenched by any unyieldedness to the revealed will of God. So to know to do good and to do it not, that's sin, and thereby you've quenched the spirit. Think about this. In the context of lying, anger, stealing, and abusive speech, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Folks, to grieve the Spirit is synonymous with quenching the Spirit. If you quench the Spirit, you are certainly grieving His Spirit. And so while grieving the Spirit emphasizes the relational side of things, it's pretty much the equivalent to quenching the Spirit. We quench the Spirit when we let a priori ideas overrule biblical teaching. Now, folks, I mean, this could, this could be true of any of us. There may be things that we've always believed because that's what we were taught way back when. If at some point moving forward, you realize, you know what? What I've always thought about X, Y, or Z from way back when, I realize now it, it does not line up with the Bible. Well, then you need to either come into accord with what the Bible does teach or you end up quenching the Spirit. 
We quench the Spirit when we fail to teach and preach what God told, tells us to. Folks, I, I don't like admitting this, but there have been some times, not a lot, there's been at least a handful of times when whew, I knew that when I stood there or I stood at the old church pulpit, I, I knew that what I was about to preach and teach was not going to land well with everybody. I'm just confessing the truth to you. I'm made of, I'm made of clay just like you are. And I can be weak just like you can be weak. Um, and so if on any occasion God's spirit has led me, and sometimes God may lead me, and this hasn't happened a lot unless I've quenched the spirit, um, but maybe I'm planning on preaching on X, and then the spirit of God says, no, 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 I want you to preach on Y. For me to not do that, well, I've, I've quenched his spirit. I wasn't planning on doing the seven I am statements that was, that was not what I had planned. In my, in my little office with my uh, pre-planning stuff, it, that wasn't what I had planned next. But I felt like that's what God wanted me to do. And then the Sunday when we had the four except Christ after the service and one communicated afterwards online, Kevin, the whole, the, all the staff, we were in, um, uh, texting back and forth about what had happened, and I think Kevin was the one who made a comment, something like, I guess that was confirmation that God's Spirit did want you to preach this series. And so, man, to not do what you sense the Lord wants you to do, that is to quench His Spirit. So, don't resist the Spirit's ministry. Be receptive to Spirit-initiated promptings. That's verse 19. Number two, be receptive to Spirit-anointed proclamations. That's in verse 20. So verse 20 simply says, do not despise prophecies. Now, it's so easy for us to think that when it says do not despise prophecies, that's regarding the, the prophesying of future truth. It's not limited to that. It's basically talking about any prophetic utterance. Now, look, I'm a preacher, but my office is a prophetic kind of office in that I proclaim truth. Okay? Um, so Paul is basically saying, don't be cynical toward prophetic utterances. Don't be cynical toward all the proclamations that you might hear. God is using those whom he has gifted to speak truth that is good for your soul. And I think here's, here's where, if we're not real careful, we can hear somebody who is proclaiming truth and we're resistant to it when it comes to application, when, when, I'm, when I'm teaching preacher boys, I tell them application is where you can get in trouble the quickest because you, you might try to make an application that's not appropriate. You might try to take it too far. And so sometimes when we're hearing someone proclaim truth and that, that brother is, is applying that to our lives, we might think, oh, now, wait a minute. Now, you done gone to meddling. You know how we often talk about that? You done gone to meddling? Sometimes when we think somebody's done gone to meddling, it might be that we done gone to quenching. Just a thought. Um, so, verse 20, we, we, we should be open and receptive to spirit-anointed proclamations, spirit-anointed preaching. All right, now let's make sure we clarify something. Does God give any new Direct revelation today. Any new direct revelation today? Now, I know when I, when I ask something like that, some of you are like, ooh, I, I think the answer is no. But time I say no, he's going to say wrong. Um, uh, Cindy, I saw you do no. Jeff, I saw you do nope. And you would be right. There is no new revelation today. Does God give any revelation today, not new, but does God give any revelation today apart from the written word? Now, easy now, that one's a little bit trickier. And I believe the answer to that is yes. It's not new revelation, but it's revelation. And I believe the answer to that is probably yes because of dreams and visions 
And some of you, you've heard me make reference to this. You've heard James Fourlines make reference to this. Folks, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is doing something in some of these Muslim countries. The stories are repeated, and they are similar. How someone who's never had a copy of the Bible, and they're having these dreams and these, these visions, and they have them over and over and over. The same dream, the same vision. And then there are numerous stories of how those dreams and those visions cause them to seek answers to help them interpret what that dream or that vision was, and they get introduced to Jesus. Tim Hutchinson, you may or may not recognize the name, but he's somebody that we support. We've supported Tim Hutchinson for several years. He's a part of the Keystone Project, a global network of churches and leaders committed to fulfilling the Great Commission in this generation. Tim Hutchinson is one of my son Jake's best friends. He was in Jake's wedding. Uh, He and Jake played basketball together at Bible College. So Tim sent an email. It's been a little while ago, and it focused on a new friendship that he's developing with a Mossad. Now, I don't know. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but M-A-S-O-U-D, Mossad. He's a Muslim. However, Tim is convinced that God's been working in Mossad's heart long before they met. One warm evening, Tim and a friend went to visit Mossad. When they sat down with him, he started to talk about how he had been experiencing a lot of stomach pain. It was so bad that he was ready to go to the hospital to see what was wrong. Worried about the sickness, Tim wanted to pray that Jesus would heal him. So he shared a Bible passage about Jesus' power to heal and asked if he could pray over Mossad in Jesus' name. And Mossad said, yes, I would welcome that. So they prayed over him that night. And when Tim saw him a few days later, he confirmed, the doctors confirmed his stomach was healed. He said, I have no more pain. He continued, now, now you must ask Jesus to heal my friends back. And you must also ask Jesus to help me find a job. And he did. Tim prayed for him again. Later on, Tim and Mossad were talking about how God speaks to us. Mossad said, God has spoken to me in a dream many times. Now, keep in mind, Mossad is very smart. He has a master's degree in engineering. He always did well in school. He had this exact dream um, several times in his life and confirms over and over and over that it's from God. Listen to what he says. In my dream, I'm at school taking a test with my other classmates but I cannot finish the test. I do not know the answers to be able to complete the test. And my classmates have the same problem. I feel I must do something different to be able to finish the test, but I don't know what to do. I am very nervous because I know this test is very important. Tim and his teammates prayed about the interpretation of the dream. They believe God gave them the answer. They believe the school represents Islam and the test is life or the road to salvation. In Islam, there is nothing he can do to finish the test. But they believe that a man in white, Jesus, will appear in his dream to complete the test for him and his classmates. Tim requested prayer. Um, Pray that God will reveal this to him or that God will use us like Joseph to share the interpretation with him and that it will fall on good soil. So, man, wouldn't it be neat to one day just be be bebopping around heaven? Hey, what's your name? Uh, I'm I'm Musad. Musad, are you the guy that had that dream about not? Yes, that was me. And I put my faith in Jesus and he finished the test for me. So I I believe God's doing that. I I, I know he is. I'm I'm convinced that he is. Um, So um, don't resist the Spirit's ministry. That's verses 19 and 20. Number two, don't believe everything you hear either. That's verses 21 and 22. Don't resist the Spirit's ministry. Don't believe everything you hear. So I've already made reference to it, but it's almost like in the first two verses, don't be cynical. But in the next two verses, don't be gullible. Therefore, I'm going to put these two truths together, and then we'll kind of work them separately. Discern truth and cling to it. That's verse 21. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and then hold fast what is good. All right? So discern truth and cling to it. 
Number two, discern error and reject it. That's verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Now, you may have already picked up the reason I've used the word discern there is because of that word test. Test, um, test everything. The word test means to test in order to verify the character of something. Deacons in our church are to be tested in the minds and the hearts of our people before they're put in office. Um, truth is to be tested. It's almost to be sifted to see if there are any theological lumps in it. All of those ideas are a part of this word test. So why the need for such testing? Why should we test everything that we hear, everything that is proclaimed to be something representing biblical truth. Why the need for such testing? Because there are more spirits out there than the Holy Spirit. We understand that, right? There are more spirits out there than the Holy Spirit. When Paul says to test everything in this context, he's specifically talking about various words of prophecy that might be delivered in an assembly of whatever size. For us, test every single bit of spiritual instruction that you hear from anybody. And that includes me. That includes me. That is one of the reasons, folks, why I find it so unbelievably um, burdensome. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but the responsibility kind of way. I mean, just now, it, every time I stand up here on a Wednesday, on a Sunday, wherever I am, man, the weight, the weight, the responsibility to make sure what I tell you is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So whenever you hear anybody in this room, any other room, on the TV, on the radio, test everything that you hear. Make sure that it is legit. All right, so here's the difficulty, though. It's like Paul, man, now I realize Paul wrote what the Holy Spirit told him to write, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be careful with my criticism here. He said to test everything, but he didn't tell us how to test. He didn't, tell, he didn't give us the criteria about which to test stuff. So let me see if I can help us. First test, content. Content. Obviously, if the content of what we're hearing, if the content, and, and, and it, this can apply to what you read as well, if the content of what you hear or read does not line up with Scripture, then Houston, we've got a problem. So let me, let me break that down and give you several um, aspects of this idea of testing the content. First, if it doesn't teach truth about the Scripture's authority and supremacy, reject it. Reject it. This is not a time, well, well, no, don't give me no well, well. If it does not line up with Scripture, it's authority and supremacy, the fact that the Scriptures are infallible and inerrant and authoritative, kiss it goodbye. It's not worth your time. I long for you, and I know many of you are already like this. You need to be Berean. You need to be Berean. The Berean believers. Listen to what Scripture says about them in Acts 17, 11. Now, these, the Berean believers, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Now, he's not necessarily saying that about the recipients of the Thessalonian letter, but those who had run him out of town earlier. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining, testing the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So if, if it's Paul's preaching, okay, fine. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna examine what you say and line it up with the scriptures. And so folks, you will never hear me gripe and complain if, if, if you tell me. Now, Jeff, I'm going to tell you. Now, I went home after the service on Sunday, and I, I, I double-checked behind you to see if what you said was true. Because if it ain't, oh, mercy. You talk, Kim talk about my hair being on fire. My whole soul will be on fire because I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong. If it isn't biblical, consider it diabolical. 
Nothing must be allowed to supplant God's written word as the final guide for faith and truth. Number two, if it doesn't teach the truth about Jesus, reject it. No debate, no discussion, no well. Um, remember Jesus' question, who, who, who do men say that I am? If anybody's answer to that is anything in any way short of Jesus being God, God the Son, a separate person, but with equal deity with God the Father and God the Spirit, if, if they say anything different from that, reject it. Show them the door. 1 John 4, 1 to 3. Beloved, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, and the emphasis there is the full teaching about Jesus. If that spirit does not confess the full teaching about Jesus, it's not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So anybody, any organization, any channel on YouTube, whatever, that denies Jesus being Jesus, reject it. Thirdly, if it doesn't teach the truth about the gospel, reject it. Reject it. Um, this is the third time you've heard these verses quoted in the last two months. Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9. Paul says, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But now listen to what he says here. But even if we are an angel from heaven, I think it's interesting that he said that. Because what was Lucifer before he became the devil? He was an angel. So he says, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, folks, in the Pitt County translation, that basically says, let him go to hell. If anybody is proclaiming anything other than the fact we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, let them spend eternity in hell. That's how serious. Because for, any, for anybody to teach anything other than that, they're going to be contributors to other people going to hell. Former NASDAQ chairman Bernie Madoff. You'll remember that name, right? He ran a Ponzi scheme for nearly 20 years, bilking an estimated eight billion dollars from Wall Street investors. When the scam finally came to light, it unleashed a shockwave of outrage around the world. It was the largest and furthest reaching investment fraud ever. But in agreement with John MacArthur, the evil of Madoff's embezzlement pales in comparison to an even more diabolical fraud being carried out in the name of Christ under the bright lights of television cameras on religious networks worldwide every single day. Faith healers and prosperity preachers promise miracles in return for money, conning their viewers out of more than a billion dollars annually. They have operated this racket on television for more than five decades. Worst of all, they do it with the tacit acceptance of most of the Christian community. Man, Elaine sent me um, a, a, um, a little video clip um, two days ago. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, it was one of these um, prosperity preachers, his name's escaping me. You would know it if I, if I could recall it. And I mean, he's being asked a question. And he... He, he initially, you could tell, he, he had, man, he riled up. And then he come back, it's, it almost looked like, man, there was a demon wanting to come out of him. And then he's like, wait a minute. It was eerie. So someone needs to say it plainly. So I'm going to borrow words. The faith healers and he, um, health and wealth prosperity preachers who dominate religious television, they're shameless frauds. Their message is not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing spiritual and miraculous about their own stage chicanery. It is all a devious ruse designed to take advantage of desperate people. 
they're not godly ministers, but they're greedy imposters who corrupt the word of God for money's sake. They're not real pastors who shepherd the flock of God, but they're hirelings who only des- whose only design is to fleece the sheep. Their love of money is glaringly obvious in what they say as well as how they live. They claim to possess great spiritual power, but in reality, they are rank materialists and enemies of everything holy. Number four, if it doesn't teach the truth about morality, reject it. If it doesn't teach the truth about morality, reject it. If, if you listen to anybody and, and their teaching downplays holiness, plays it off as being archaic, old school, you know, that, that, you know, this is the 21st century. Folks, morality doesn't change. If, 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 if anybody you listen to does not seem to emphasize the need to live right and do what's right, man, reject it. Um, Paul asked the question, shall, shall we sin that grace may abound? What was his reply? God forbid. That's foolishness. So again, Paul says, test everything. The first test is content. Second test is character. Character. So not only do you examine the content of what is being taught, what is being proclaimed, preached, but also consider the character of the person to the best of your ability. Sometimes this is going to be more challenging. But if any preacher, if any teacher lives contrary to scriptural morality, cease listening to them. Stop listening to them. Jesus said that by, you, by their fruits, you're going to know them. Sometimes it may take a little while. Matthew 7, verses 15 to 16, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Sheep's clothing. Bah. Soft and gentle and cuddly. Say all the right things. But inside, inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Eventually, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bear fruit. The truth will come out. If his life is marked by unrepentant lust, unrepentant greed, or disobedience to God's word, do not listen to him, do not endorse him, do not recommend him or her in some cases. Most of the TV preachers who claim to have fresh revelation from God, they're godless showmen. Most of them are. So discern truth and cling to it. That's verse 21. Test everything, hold fast what is good. So we do the testing and then man, you hear truth. And you know, this, this could happen Sunday. Jeff Keaton will be here and man, he may share a perspective on something. It's not going to be new truth, but it might be a, a, a new perspective, maybe an application for you and your family or your grandkids. So if you hear something, you read something, and man, that's good. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Hold fast. So whether you like heights or not, you're going with me on this trip to the Grand Canyon. You're going. And yes, we're going to fly. You get there on one of these trails in the Grand Canyon, and we actually open it up. You could invite your grandkids to come along with you or your children. And so as you're walking along, if you're like my wife, Jennifer, you might be hugging the mountain. And then whoever else is with you might be on the outside edge. Imagine that your child or your grandchild or somebody else that you dearly love slips and falls. But before they do, you grab a hold of their foot, their hand or something. How are you going to hold on to them? You're going to hold fast. We don't typically use that kind of language, hold fast. But that's what you're going to be doing. Same thing with Bible truth. When you hear something, you test it, you realize, wow, man, I need to apply that to my life. Hold on to that truth. Hold on to it. And then discern error and reject it. That's in verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. So especially most of us are familiar with the King James translation there, abstain from all appearance of evil. Folks, you've got to remember now, Scripture should always be interpreted in its context. And that phrase can be taken out of context and made to apply to anything and everything. Now, look, hear me out. I'm not suggesting that we just throw caution to the wind and do anything. No. But it's not saying that if something, if something appears to be evil, when in reality it may not be, upon further investigation, well, then you reject it. You stay away. No, 
if, if the appearance of what you're hearing is not what it proclaims to be, if the appearance of the person that you're listening to, that's the context, if, if, the per, if that person is not what they appear to be, well, then you stay away. Abstain from all appearance. Every occasion where that kind of thing happens, you stay away. You reject it. So can I just give this summary of these verses? Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, the truth of your word. And Father, you, you know my heart better than I know my heart, but you therefore know how thrilled I am to pastor a group of people that I mean a large percentage, and I would say it's bumping up close to 100%. They want to hear the truth. And that certainly makes my job a lot easier. Oh, but Lord, help us to never take anything for it. Lead, God and direct us, O oh Lord. Lead, God and direct the pastors, our deacons. Help us all, Lord, to be in tune with your word, led by your spirit. And um, may we be people that hear truth, discern truth, and hold on to it when we hear it, and rejecting anything accordingly that's not. That's my prayer, Lord. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.